how's everyone this evening? Yeah. Motions other than government? The honorable member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill to be intituled Net Zero Carbon Act, and I move, seconded by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, that the same be now received and read a first time. Sure, Kerry. Kerry. Net Zero Carbon Act, Bill Number 127, read a first time. Overview, Minister, or Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Net Zero Carbon Act sets in law our emission reduction targets, including the achievement of net zero emissions by 2040. This bill also provides for an advisory committee to assist the minister in addressing climate change and establishes reporting requirements related to the progress made towards our goals, and also requires the periodic assessment of and reporting on the climate risks facing Prince Edward Island. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Bel Charlottetown, Belvedere, and the Opposition has the Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We now call Motion 97 be read. Motion. Shall I carry? Sure. Motion 97. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, the following motion. Whereas the Mi'kmaq and the British Crown entered into the Peace and Friendship Treaties, which make all Islanders treaty people, and whereas the Supreme Court of Canada and the R versus Marshall affirmed the Mi'kmaq Treaty right to fish in pur pursuit of a moderate livelihood, and whereas Mi'kmaq fishers in Atlantic Canada have been subject to violence and harassment, including damage to equipment as a, as a result of exercising their <coughs> treaty rights, therefore be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly condemn the violence and harassment against Mi'kmaq fishers in the Atlantic region, Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly express its support for the free and safe exercise of the treaty right to fish in pursuit of a moderate livelihood. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to take every necessary measure to ensure Mi'kmaq fishers in Prince Edward Island are able to exercise this right safely without prejudice. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to take every necessary measure, measure to educate Islanders on the Peace and Friendship Treaties. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition to start the debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. A phrase I often use in this House is wicked problems. I use that phrase, wicked problem, when I'm referring to vast, complex, long-standing, and often very controversial issues that only government has the capacity to address. I'm talking about, when I say wicked problems, such issues as the climate emergency, poverty and pervasive inequality, and reconciliation of Aboriginal issues. All of these are long-standing, vast, complex, potentially controversial issues. The peace and friendship treaties between the Mi'kmaq and settler people date back to the 1700s. While other treaties exist between First Nations and governments across Canada, our treaties here are notable because they are peace and friendship treaties. They were not designed to force Aboriginal people to surrender their land or resources. They were entered into by Aboriginal peoples and the Crown to support peaceful relations between them. These treaties represent agreements made a long time ago, but they carry with them consequences for those of us who are the contemporary representatives of the signatories to those treaties. They are agreements between the original people of this part of the world, people who have inhabited the land for many thousands of years, and the settler people who arrived here relatively recently. When you hear the phrase, we are all treaty people. That is what is being articulated. These agreements are still alive. They are still applicable. We are, in some senses, the descendants of the original signatories of those documents. And we all have responsibilities to ensure that those treaties are upheld. 
Canada has a very checkered history when it comes to upholding the rights contained in some of these treaties. Quite literally, centuries have passed, and yet many of the rights in these agreements are still not respected, with some, with some people even still questioning their legal validity. Reconciliation is the hard process, the really hard process of working through how we here today in the 21st century can implement the intent of those treaties that were signed hundreds of years ago. Reconciliation is not an apology and a handshake. Reconciliation is not a sorry and a hug. Reconciliation is the enormously difficult work that will test all Canadians, whether part of the Aboriginal community or of its, the settler peoples. Understanding and implementing a moderate livelihood fishery is but one example of this difficult and challenging work that we are all called to do. Successive federal governments have failed miserably to deal with this issue. And this failure has led us to the point where communities are being divided, neighbours are alienated from each other, and fear and violence are very present. It's a dreadful situation, and it's a far cry from the peace and friendship that we set out to achieve when those treaties were signed. And it's one that demands a swift and a peaceful resolution. That means action from a federal government whose playbook has contained little more than decade upon decade upon decade of inaction. Clearly, the jurisdictional authority here lies with the government of Canada negotiating on a nation-to-nation -nation basis with, with the First Nations of this land. As a province within the Federation of Canada, Prince Edward Island, though, has a role to play. While we are not a nation state, we have an obligation to recognize the implications of the Peace and Friendship Treaties, and as a sub-national jurisdiction, to clearly state support for the Mi'kmaq in asserting the rights contained in those agreements. That's what this motion is about. As well as condemning the violence that has already erupted in other provinces, something I'm quite sure that all members of this House will have no problem supporting, it is also and primarily about the exercise of the right to a moderate livelihood fishery as articulated in those peace and friendship treaties. The Marshall decision, a Supreme Court of Canada ruling from 1999, affirmed a treaty right to hunt, fish, and gather in pursuit of a moderate livelihood arising out of those peace and friendship treaties. While this answered some questions, it left some unanswered, and it raised even more questions. We still don't have a complete definition of what lo moderate livelihood is, and where the issue of conservation fits into the assertion of this right remains very unclear. What is clear, however, is that Mi'kmaq people have looked after this world, this part of the world, and this resource sustainably for millennia. At a time and a place where so much has been stripped away from the Aboriginal people of this land, their deep-seated attachment to and their reverence for the rest of creation and of the, re of the natural world remains a constant presence. We are all concerned about conservation and sustainability. But while settler people are relative newcomers to these concepts, it is something that's so deeply embedded in Aboriginal cultures and it embodies a depth of understanding that we settler people would do well to listen to and to emulate. The modern practice of conservation as we have implemented it was necessitated by the fact that as settler people, we threaten the very existence of the resources of the land and the sea by our over-enthusiastic harvesting for financial gain and affluence. The pursuit of wealth and prominence was, at that time, a concept quite foreign to the original people of what we now call Canada. Rather than pillage a resource, Aboriginal people recognised the connection between humans 
and the rest of nature. They revered this connection and they protected it and taught their young children to do the same. This spring, the Mi'kmaq of Abiguit are planning to take advantage of their treaty rights and to launch a moderate livelihood fishery. Support by government for this moderate livelihood fishery is important. Government must signal that it has confidence in the relationship with the Mi'kmaq people. PEI, as a party of the tripartite, tripartite agreement between the province, the federal government, and the Mi'kmaq people, we have a responsibility to act and show our respect and support of this legal treaty right. If we fail in our responsibility, it runs the risk of eroding confidence in other areas of this critical relationship. As I said earlier, this is a terribly difficult issue, but we must not be afraid to have those hard conversations. For far too many politicians have delicately skated around it for far too long. At its core, the moderate livelihood fishery is a legally recognized treaty right. We cannot play politics with the law. We must stand for it. Our communities come no closer to a resolution if the government does not take the po every possible step it can to engage with all stakeholders and government counterparts. The least we can do is try. While discussions have been contentious elsewhere, I am very hopeful here on Prince Edward Island. Mi'kmaq leaders and fishers have been in conversation with others about how the moderate livelihood fishery will work. And I wish everybody involved in these discussions the best as they continue their hard work. And I hope and expect a positive and peaceful outcome. I encourage all other members of this House to express their support tonight for this right and this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Sure Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Communication is the key to any healthy relationship. Anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows this. It doesn't matter if it's with a spouse, a friend, or a colleague, communication is key. We are seeing the devastating effects of a lack of communication between our federal government and our Aboriginal leaders. Government after government at the federal level have ignored the requests of both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal fishers for years to address the issues surrounding moderate livelihood fishing. Instead of peace and friendship, we are now left with fear and division between these two groups. Several commercial fishermen have reached out to me with their fears. They are afraid that conservation will not be respected and that their livelihood and their ability to provide for their families may be compromised. I feel confident this concern can and must be overcome with meaningful dialogue. For an untold millennia, conservation and respect for the earth and its resources have been core to the success of Aboriginal people. They understand the importance of a healthy relationship with our oceans just as many of our non-Aboriginal fishers do. This traditional and deep knowledge forms their relationship with the world. Aboriginal worldviews demonstrate in the relationship between humans and the environment that the environment is the top priority. Without a healthy environment, a healthy earth, it is impossible to have a healthy, successful existence. What can't be lost in the fear and division is that the, uh, the court in the Marshall decisions acknowledge the importance of conservation. The Marshall decisions allow the treaty right to be limited, but only if it is for a pressing and substantial public purpose after appropriate consultation with the Aboriginal community and goes no further than it is required. Most importantly, Aboriginal communities are demonstrating that they are conscious of this concern and more than capable of addressing it through the articulation of their continued cultural practice of living sustainably by de developing management plans as requested. There is no reason to doubt that the Mi'kmaq people will continue to uphold conservation efforts as they have for millennia. At the heart of the fears, the violence, and the division between non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal fishers is conservation and the federal government's inaction to work nation to nation to establish a clear definition of moderate livelihood. Both groups of fishers are concerned for the sustainability of their way of life. A way of life they hope and dream they can pass on to their children and grandchildren. 
and both sides are well aware that there is no livelihood for anyone without a resource. I am hopeful that the Minister of Fisheries and Communities will speak clearly on this important issue by supporting this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fisheries industry is an incredibly important part of our island economy. It has contributed to what has made Prince Edward Island world famous. My department has long been partners with the federal government and all island fishers to ensure that this resource is well cared for and sustainable for all future generations. The term moderate livelihood has recently drawn a great deal of public attention. I can certainly appreciate the interest on this topic because frankly, there is a great deal of uncertainty around what that means. Mr. Speaker, staff in our department have been in constant communication with our federal counterparts about finding clarity around the definition of moderate livelihood as the management of the fishery is a federal responsibility. Mr. Speaker, through these discussions, it is my understanding that the federal government is under negotiations with First Nations to work towards a collaborative goal that could be deemed acceptable by all fishers. Mr. Speaker, speaking directly to the motion, I very much condemn all violence and harassment against any fisher on Prince Edward Island, no matter the scenario. There is no place for any violence in our communities, and I strongly believe that Islanders know this. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, I will continue to work with my colleagues at the provincial level, as well as our appropriate federal counterparts to promote a transparent and collaborative approach for all Prince Edward Island fishers. Mr. Speaker, I cannot stress enough the importance of the parties ensuring an orderly, safe and sustainable fishery environment for all Prince Edward Island fishers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just have to speak to this motion. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I rose in this house before and spoke to the, uh, the Annabella going down and how my family's entire lineage is owed to these peace and friendship treaties and the Mi'kmaq who honoured those treaties and saved those, those families that were shipwrecked on this shore, these shores. That, that's part of the, the, the treaties of 1725. They were honouring those treaties. And um, it, it's just so very important that we recognise how much uh, we actually owe to our Mi'kmaq um, hosts, essentially. Um, so some of the families that uh, are descended is, is not just the Ramses in my background, it's the Albanese, the Cars, English, Inglis, McKendrick, McNeil, McMillan, McIntosh, MacArthur, McDougall, McGugan, McKay, Mackenzie, Murphy, Montgomery, as in Lucy Maud, Sinclair, Stewart, Smith, Ramsey, Taylor, and Woodside. All those family names and many more, 60 families on that one ship. That, uh, that, that has had such an impact across Prince Edward Island. Uh, the Montgomerys, with, through Lucy Maud, ha have given us our ide identity uh, as far as the, on the world stage goes. Um, so we, we owe so much to those, those natives. And uh, I'll, I'll just read the part of the treaty that, uh, that I'm referring to here, and you'll have to forgive me, it's written in language that, that uh, I would not use that the Indians shall use their best endeavors to save the lives and goods of people shipwrecked on this coast. So it, people that arrived here and it encountered violence, whether it might be by nature or whatever, uh, people needing help. And once upon a time, there, there was a violence between the settler people and the Mi'kmaq. And through these peace and friendship treaties, we agreed to an end to that. And so I, I absolutely support this motion and it's, uh, at, at its essence is to proceed in peace and friendship and condemn the violence and harassment. Uh, how could we do anything else after they owing so much? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quay, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the member for O'Leary Inverness that represents uh, the largest Indigenous uh, population in Prince Edward Island, uh, predominantly on Lennox Island and the surrounding communities, I did want to also uh, uh, speak on this particular motion, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I've, I've uh, lived in this community all my life. Uh, I've got some tremendous friends on Lennox Island. Uh, it's a part of my riding. I've got to political infrastructure in that riding. Uh, as well as the rest of my district. And, uh, you know, I've certainly uh, have come to appreciate the Mi'kmaq culture, uh, the challenges that uh, people go through that uh, are affiliated with whatever particular culture, but it's specifically the Mi'kmaq culture. Uh, sometimes things aren't always uh, what everybody would want them to be. And, uh, you know, when this motion come forward, I'm sort of trying to figure out how, you know, how am I going to respond to this. I do feel it's important to speak to it and it's important that uh, the Minister of Fisheries has raised his views on it too. Uh, uh, certainly issues about a sustainable fishery is extremely important. But there's fundamental realities, Mr. Speaker, and I've been a Minister of this Crown uh, uh, in, in the past and uh, had numerous briefings, briefings around Indigenous rights, uh, treaty rights, all of those realities. Uh, the, the, the facts are that these are real, Mr. Speaker. There's no way you can skirt around these particular issues. You have to understand that our forefathers made arrangements and deals uh, with, uh, for whatever the reasons are. And, and governments and legislatures continue to build on those arrangements and deals. We're always trying to amend things, to improve things, to try to make things better, to, to create a more inclusive uh, society and, and within our friends and neighbours. And uh, when... Uh, we talk about the issue of a treaty to pursue a moderate livelihood. Uh, you know, I've got lots of people and constituents, especially in the commercial fishery, would ask you, what's your view on that? Well, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that's already been entrenched in a, in a treaty that's been arranged with, by the, the Crown with, uh, with uh, the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, we have to uphold that, Mr. Speaker. It's very important that, that uh, our predecessors' uh, rules that they made were made in the right spirit and intent, and we have to uphold that. But when we talk about issues about violence regarding these types of issues, I like the Minister of Fisheries. I, can, I condemn any form of violence when it comes to uh, trying to instill a, a point of view on people. These things have to be discussed. They have to go through uh, the realities of debate. We all have to have an, a, an objective mind and an appreciation for each, each side of this, Mr. Speaker. And uh, when, when the motion calls for a support of an expression of treaty rights, I support that, ultimately. That's uh, what our forefathers have uh, made decisions on, and uh, we have to, to follow that. But ultimately, these were peace and friendship treaties, like my colleague, and I guess we are descendants of one another through the Ramses. Uh, we sort of went political different directions by times, our, our uh, ancestors, but at, in the end of the day, uh, you know, my ancestors uh, were uh, uh, incumbent upon their help and support to Native people, but also from the Indigenous people back to them. And uh, I've got lots of stories from you know, my upbringing, from my grandfather and great-grandfather uh, in their interactions with uh, the Mi'kmaq people in the community. And uh, you know, I've always had the utmost respect. I think I talked about a motion that the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty had regarding uh, uh, issues of racial discrimination and things of that nature. And I talked a little bit about uh, John Andrew Francis, who's the father of, uh, of uh, Senator Brian Francis, and uh, you know how what great respect I had for him. I won't linger on in that. And same with Madeline Sark. Uh, some people like that, Chief Darlene Bernard. I know all these people. I grew up with these people. I went to school with these people. I go to the community organizations. All the same. We're all the same people. We're all the same people of O'Leary Inverness. And uh, and over time, you you gain a far greater appreciation for the challenges and each individual's issues, and and uh, that's really important. And I think it's really incumbent upon uh, you know the federal government with their. Uh, it, uh, Crown and Indigenous Relations Ministry, uh, Minister Carolyn Bennett, to work out trying to get a clarity around the issue of what is defined as moderate livelihood. That's the part that I don't know if anybody can truly define yet. I, it's, you know, it's, is it up to me to define that? No. Is it up to who? But it is, it is up to a negotiation between that department, the Department of Fisheries and Ocean, 
It probably is up to uh, the Lennox Island Band Council what their views would be and Le Nue and the Mi'kmaq Confederacy to kind of come up with some consistent policy and views and how that they would uh, define that. And it's up to them then to uh, take that to uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans who is really responsible for a sustainable fishery and to make sure that that uh, uh, can continue on. Because in the end of the day, if it's not sustainable, it's no good to anybody. Nobody wants to, to live in any community that it isn't sustainable. And uh, so that, that's really key in what we do. Now, if I think a little bit of Lennox Island, I can think back. I've been around for a fair number of years, Mr. Speaker, in, in my community. And I live next door to Lennox Island Band Council. I'm the next community, Lot 11. Uh, I remember when, uh, the, actually, there was a member of the legislature here, Joshua MacArthur, who's the MLA for Second Prince. And he was involved with uh, encouraging uh, the government to support uh, building a bridge uh, across the, I guess it would be the Conway Narrows area to uh, Malpec Bay to, uh, to Lennox Island. Uh, I remember many people that, uh, from Lennox Island that would be coming over to play hockey. Some of the, the people that I played hockey with in minor hockey lived in Lennox Island. And uh, they, had, they had to go across uh, the ice, Mr. Speaker, to get, to the, to get home. And, uh, you know, yet we all played hockey together. They had that additional challenge. But anyway, I think it was 1973, it could be 72, 73, a decision was made to build a bridge. And what a difference that made. It linked East Bitterford, which would be, I guess, the mainland of PEI. It's hard to describe PEI as the main, <laughs> mainland, but uh, to Lennox Island. And uh, that, uh, that bridge eventually was constructed. Joshua McCarthy played a significant role in seeing that happen. And uh, that changed Lennox Island significantly. It, it wasn't as uh, a place that was a little harder to get to. Uh, interaction between the communities uh, was pretty frequent. Um, and uh, that made a significant difference in that. But as you fast forward to some of those things, uh, eventually an issue happened, what's called a food fishery. And uh, Lennox Island, uh, they were all uh, individuals that were part of the band, were given the ability to uh, uh, have three lobster traps and fish for their own food and livelihood. That was a very contentious issue, Mr. Speaker, within the community. But over time, Mr. Speaker, those, those fears were, uh, weren't realized. Things happened uh, successfully. The band now kind of fishes it collaboratively, uh, and they provide food fishery uh, to their individuals on Lennox Island. But not only that, Mr. Speaker, but the band made decisions to help support the bigger community. So when, when the Rink and Tyne Valley burnt down uh, in uh, 2019, Mr. Speaker, uh, that impacted that community as much as any other community in, in the Tyne Valley region. And uh, the, uh, the band eventually made a decision when, when St. Anne's Sunday, which is kind of the, the, the main festival, celebrates uh, uh, the Catholicism in the, in the, in the indigenous people uh, and the patron saint, St. Anne, uh, as a particular day in the community that they usually have a, uh, a, a, f a celebration of lobster and other events and, and parades and things of that nature, Mr. Speaker. But the people of Lennox Island and the band made a decision to uh, donate, still continue with the, what would be normally a St. Anne's Sunday feast, but to donate that to anybody who wanted to buy tickets to support the, the Rink and Tyne Valley, Mr. Speaker. I think that was, you know, that's a, that's a significant overture that that, that uh, community made on behalf of the greater community of Lennox Island. I think that needs to be acknowledged and uh, appreciated, Mr. Speaker. Uh, then, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, when we, we move forward a little bit further into the, the situation uh, around uh, indigenous issues and rights and moderate livelihood, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, speak with uh, Chief Darlene Bernard, as well as uh, uh, even her predecessor pr prior to that, uh, uh, Matilda Ramjatten. Say these are all people, they're friends, they're, we've grown up together and we've worked together. And uh, I've had a real good meeting with uh, band councillor uh, Madeline uh, Sark uh, on some of the challenges to face, as well as Richard Guimon and other band councillors. But these people are my friends, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they're my neighbours. I've always considered them, uh, anybody uh, in the surrounding communities, to be my next door neighbours. I've uh, played hockey uh, with uh, people from Lennox Island. I've uh, uh, worked on Lennox Island. I was uh, uh, a teacher, substitute teacher at the John J. Sark Elementary School, um, community school, all those things 
We've all interacted. We all work well together. I would hope that it always will remain. Uh, one of the things that I, I'll boast about sometimes that Lennox Island is actually the fastest growing community in Western PEI. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're having all the same challenges that we're faced with as society. Housing issues are a complex issue in Lennox Island. Economic development, energy sustainability. Um, we've been very fortunate. Uh, the MP for Egmont, Bobby Morrissey, has been very helpful in, in uh, getting dollars to come to the, our community, which when it comes to, if I say there's going to be improvements to the school in Lennox Island or a new early years center in Lennox Island, that money circulates. There's contractors, there's electricians, there's uh, uh, pavers. Everything happens. It's all the surrounding community. That those are the people who benefit from this. So Ellerslie Wright Stop to Dennis Motors. They all have significant uh, uh, clientele that are from people who reside on Lennox Island, Mr. Speaker. Right today, there's uh, construction of a new fire hall in Lennox Island. Uh, that fire department is part of mutual aid in Western PEI and supports uh, the Tyne Valley Fire Department, which could be, if I ever had a tragedy, you know, needed, needed an extra fire truck, it's probably coming from Lennox Island, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I, I certainly uh, understand, uh, you know, the, the community is trying to grow, it's trying to develop. I think it's working with the, the Minister for Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal and trying to come up with some energy sustainability issues. Uh, you know, whether it's windmills, solar farms, uh, biomass heating systems, all that stuff, uh, those are things that that community is working on. I'm happy as an MLA to try to support that. Uh, when, uh, you know, I'm always in touch with the, one of the issues recently, there was promises made, uh, I won't say by who, but on the, on the government side, that they're going to start paving roads in Lennox Island, Mr. Speaker, as a responsibility of the provincial government. Uh, I, I support that. That's a great thing. Now I'm waiting for the pavement. I guess some has actually started. Uh, and I'm looking forward to more in that part of my district, Mr. Speaker. Um, if we look at uh, issues that they're growing on, I think they're, they're trying to develop. I see there's some advertised positions for a cannabis uh, uh, grow and uh, a retail outlet in Lennox Island, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the band is working on these things. And uh, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll be successful in, in delivering that. And Mr. Speaker, I'm well aware that the commercial fishers and the commercial fishery in the area will have its challenges. Certainly different species of fish. When we talk about moderate livelihood, the, the assumption tends to always be lobster. It could be snow crab. It could be mackerel. It could be uh, any other uh, of the fishery, fishers or tuna. The list goes on. And I think that's where we have to uh, understand that uh, you know, we have to share our access. We have to try to work out uh, what is sustainable and how to re divide those resources up, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I think it's certainly been clear that the law is pretty specific on this. Um, you know, and I certainly encourage DFO, uh, Crown and Indigenous Relations, uh, Lenue, the Lennox Island Band Council, to actually come up with very specific definitions that we can support, that we know that's going to be sustainable, and that we can continue to live in peace and harmony in my community of the Tyne Valley region, or the greater riding of Hilary Inverness, and for all the Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from Morel Zona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I won't uh, uh, take up a, a lot of time um, uh, as an MLA that, uh, that does uh, fish lobster, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, also uh, represents an area that aligns with uh, two of the three uh, reserves, um, the Morale and Scotchart Reserves of Edward First Nations. I'd like to, uh, to speak to this motion. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was, as the member from Willary had mentioned, there was great concerns when the, uh, the commercial fleets were, uh, were brought uh, uh, to First Nations, and uh, we've seen uh, how well they have done. Um, you know, I'm very proud to fish alongside our Edward First Nation. Uh, Fishers, uh, Chief Gould, and the whole council there, and, and chiefs beforehand, have done a, a, a really good job of, of the professionali professionalization of the fishery uh, for Abbott, and, and that it is run there. Um, I think you know the the education of the commercial fishery, the moderate livelihood fishery, and the food fishery for Abbott, for, for for First Nations and Prince Edward Island, uh, is important. All the way is doing an amazing job of that right now, and, and uh, I encourage all the members uh, to. To look at that and and push for it, uh, 
Just uh, quickly, Mr. Speaker, I, along with the other members, condemn the violence that's happening uh, in other areas. We do not want to see uh, that here in uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, and I also believe that conservation will always be the basis for any First Nations fishery in, in PEI. It's simply the way of life for First Nations, and uh, I support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to stand in the House and affirm my support for a moderate livelihood fishery. I think this is an incredibly important issue, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the members who have taken a few moments to speak on behalf of this issue. I have heard sustainable come up a lot, and I can understand that concern, but I would also point out that the Mi'kmaq people believe that we don't just have to consider the impacts of our decisions on ourselves or even on our children, but that we have to consider the impacts of our decisions on seven generations, Mr. Speaker. Sustainability is a concept that is deeply rooted in their culture, as my honorable colleague pointed out. And I think that's a, an incredibly important piece to keep in mind. We hear the question, what is a moderate livelihood? We haven't defined a moderate livelihood. I ask my honorable colleagues, what is a moderate livelihood for you? It means that you have enough money to meet your needs. It means that you can cover all of your expenses and probably have a little bit left over to enjoy a quality of life. And I think that's a really reasonable request for the uh, food fishery. What is a moderate livelihood for any of you in this house? What is a moderate livelihood for a uh, settler fisher? What is a moderate livelihood for anyone? It means that your needs are met and you are not living below the poverty line, but you're also not just at the poverty line. And I think that uh, the onus on this lies with our federal partners who have not yet reached out on a nation to nation basis to start defining what a moderate livelihood looks like in a way that we're comfortable with to move this issue forward. But I would urge us to not let the absence of that definition on paper stop us from affirming our support for this issue because a moderate livelihood is the same to you as it is to our Indigenous communities. I recognize that I'm getting late on time, Mr. Speaker, and if there's no one else on your list, I would like to call for a standing vote on this issue. I'll get the uh, mover of the motion to close the debate. Sure. Very brief, Mr. Speaker, thank you. We're at the beginning of a very difficult and treacherous journey, and there's a lot at stake here. But we cannot be afraid to have these hard conversations. We must learn to talk together well, so we can fish together well, so we can live together well. I look forward to the standing vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, there's been a standing vote requested. Sergeant Adams, you may ring the bell. Yes. Joy, push the button. Ready for the vote? Mr. Speaker, the opposition is ready for the vote. Mr. Speaker, the third party is ready for the vote. Honourable members, those voting against the motion, please rise. Honourable members, those voting for the motion, please rise. From Charlottetown Winslow. 
the Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, and the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture, the Honorable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing, the Honorable Member from Montague Kilmuir, the Honorable Member from Cornwall Meadowbank, the Honorable Leader of the Third Party, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Honorable Member from Morel Donna, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honorable Member from O'Leary and Verness, the Honorable Member from Summerside South Drive, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Brighton, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, the Honorable Member from Summerside Wilmot, and the Honorable Member from Shine, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Honorable Members, the motion passed unanimously. Now I'll call on Corn, Cornwall Middlebanks. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomerol. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, that the Order Number 16, um, that the 16th Order of the Day be now read. Charlotte Carey. Order Number 16, Down Syndrome Day Act, Bill Number 119, ordered for third reading. Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomerol. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Charlottetown um, West Royalty that the said bill be now read a third time. Shall I carry? Carry. Bill number 119, Down Syndrome Day Act, read a third time. Honorable member from Tignish Pomero. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the said bill do now pass. Honourable Members, this bill was introduced by leave of the House, read the first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole House, reported, agreed to, without amendment, read a third time, and is now moved that the bill do not pass. All those in favour, say yea. Yay. 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 Contrary nay? Contrary nay? Nary? Nay. <laughs> Honourable Member, the bill has been passed yeah. unanimously. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Speaker of Third Party brings Bill Number 120, an act to amend the Animal Health Act. Second reading. Shall it carry? Sure. Order Number 19, an act to amend the Animal Health Act, Bill Number 120, ordered for second reading. Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks, overview. Uh, what? Are you reading it the second time? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Cornwall Meadowbanks. Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's the welfare of animals uh, on the farms and. Uh, <laughs> oh, I thought you wanted an explanation. <laughs> Mr. Sp uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by uh, O'Leary and Burness that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall I carry? carry. 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 Bill number 124, an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act, read a second time. Shall I carry? carry. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move seconded uh, by O'Leary and Burness that the order of the day be now read. Is that the one? No. I move second by O'Leary and Vernessa that the House do not resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole of the House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? <laughs> Honourable Member from Tignish, Pomero, to chair of the Committee of the Health House, please.
No, we're not in. We're not in yet. Okay. The House is now in a committee of the whole House, taking into consideration a bill to be in Kitchell an act to amend the Animal Health Act. A request has yeah, been made. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a stranger to come to the floor of the legislature here to uh, discuss this bill. Shall I carry? Yeah. Would you like to bring him forward? <laughs> Take your mask off if you want. I want you here. Yeah. Good evening. Would you please state your name, where you're from, and maybe just a brief uh, history on yourself <laughs> for Hansard, okay. so we know who we're talking to. Hey, my name is Ron Maynard. I'm uh, from uh, Tyne Valley area, and I'm the president of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Thank you and very I'm much. A, and I'm a dairy farmer. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, honourable members, is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read section by section, clause by clause, or open it up as a whole? Section by, pardon? Second. As a whole? Well, it's only okay. one section. <laughs> Great. I, I do have to go through procedure. I, I hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, so the floor is now open. Um, um, Mermaid Stratford. Oh, sorry. Maybe I'll Promoter, sort of, would you like to commence with a brief statement on the bill's intent? I, I think ultimately what this, uh, this uh, amendment to the Animal Health Act is about, uh, Mr. Chair, is it's uh, regarding uh, people who may enter a property uh, with intent to harm or provide a cause a disease or a toxic substance to uh, domestic animals uh, that could affect them, their health, or, or their contamination. And it sets out some penalties uh, that would certainly apply to uh, individuals who might do that or corporations that would be responsible for those individuals to do that. Uh, and uh, that, it's just to try to strengthen that uh, Animal Health Act in that regard. Thank you. Mer uh, Morel, oh, sorry, Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Ron. Nice to have you on the floor. Good Thank to see you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so what concerns or issues is this bill designed to address? From, from my perspective, I think it's ultimately uh, farmers, anybody who, who has animals or livestock, it doesn't have to be a, it could be a hobby farmer for that matter, has a great attachment to their, their uh, livestock or their animals. And... Uh, if people don't understand or respect that and they cause harm to those animals from a health perspective or for their well-being, uh, that can have a pretty finan big financial stress on those uh, owners of that uh, animal or livestock. And uh, sometimes the public doesn't maybe uh, acknowledge that and they, uh, people would take liberties with that. So if I use the example, uh, you know, somebody might have uh, some cattle and uh, somebody goes into uh, that uh, barn and uh, causes something that either sickens the animal or uh, harms the animal, that can have a significant impact. I, I know the Minister of Agriculture in his former uh, life as a farmer has some pretty valuable cattle. And, uh, you know, we just don't want uh, that impact to be felt by the farmer or obviously the harm done by the, to the animal. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, I, I get that. So how many reports have you heard of here in PEI that this has impacted? Not, not specifically on PEI that that has become an issue, but it is starting to become an issue globally. Uh, certainly there are larger centres where maybe there's people, uh, you know, I don't want to say people maybe of an urban mindset, go out into the country, they cause a problem. So I think we want to make sure that that uh, is prevented before it actually occurs, that there's some fairly stiff penalties uh, that would be incurred if somebody took those liberties to harm animals or livestock. So I think that's, I can't, can't recall a specific situation, but I, we have seen it in, uh, in uh, uh, plants. We, we had it with the, the needles and the potato stock. So it's, it's a similar concept to that, how, what kind of harm that that can do. But it, imagine if, if that happened to animals would be even more dire. Mermaid Stratford? Okay, so in, can you just, how widespread is the, this problem? Like, so if not in PEI, exactly, like, are you hearing it from Well, Canada? Well, from my perspective, there certainly are other provinces that have uh, implemented legislation to prevent this. 
uh, and it has occurred in other jurisdictions. So I think from that perspective, it's out there and there are other, but I think it's incumbent upon us as legislators to pre prevent these things from occurring and making sure we're a step ahead of something that happens and then have to like kitty bar the door, so to speak, where you have to try to straighten it out a little later on. So I think that's that's why we're trying to uh, be ahead of the curve here. Why I'm bringing it as a private member's bill uh, is uh, to try to uh, strengthen that. I've certainly had opportunities to consult with many livestock producers. Uh, I have talked with the Federation of Agriculture, uh, and they've also had some consultation with some of their member commodities. And uh, thus far, I haven't had too many uh, issues uh, that have been brought up about this. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So this might be a very, I guess, ignorant question question from me, but isn't is it not illegal already to poison animals? It depends how you look at that. I guess, like we use the argument of trespassing is illegal, so that that has some impact on it. But this also uh, has a greater impact for those that have livestock, for those animals that uh, their health is at risk. Uh, I used to be a livestock producer. You, you know, you can't defend all your borders. And uh, you have fences. You, have, you know, I might have had a couple hundred acres of uh, fenced area. Uh, and that's as a, as a cattle producer. You, you could have uh, something that's, uh, you know, horses could be an example. You know, you could have a lot of animals in a certain area. You can't defend that all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And... Uh, you know, we just want to make sure that those animals uh, don't have to suffer any undue harm for something that was malicious. Mermaid Stratford. Yeah, and I can understand that completely. I just, I'm surprised that it's not already laid out somewhere that it would be illegal to do that, but that's okay. So, um, are you aware of any particular groups that have been known to internationally release animals? Well, it doesn't take too much to figure out the groups like PETA. Uh, trying to think of what the acronym PETA means, but uh, Protection of Ethical Treatment of Animals, I believe. <laughs> uh, so th once again, that would be a group that uh, would be a potential uh, risk where they would have a maybe a cause that it may, and may be very well intentioned. But uh, once again, if they did something that created a problem to that particular animal, we've got to think of the the undue harm caused to the animal and the owners of that animal, I might add, too. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. Um, how would it apply to ATV um, users that would typically cross fields, for instance, if they, were, if they access pasture in order to, to uh, cross the fields? I, would, I wouldn't see that this legislation would uh, effectively deal, unless they were trying to run over the animal, then, then I see it as an issue of causing harm. That would be pure and simple trespass, and that's not really what the intent of this is. This is about trying to protect the animal itself from under harm or disease or illness. So yes, the ATV could be a risk by running over a miniature horse <laughs> or whatever, sheep and things of that nature, or, or cause undue stress to those animals. Uh, without uh, reasonable cause, so so it could have an impact on it, and if, and if so, then that's up to the, the authorities to determine who's, uh, you know, who caused the problem, investigation occurs, and, you know, the normal procedures of penalties and things of that nature apply. This is about making sure that uh, those people who own domestic animals, that this is another tool to prevent people from taking liberties with those animals. Mermaid structure. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, enclosed space is not defined in the Act. How do you how do you define it? It's anything that it contains a, a particular animal from running free or ro roaming the, the countryside. So, I would consider that to be a fence, a pen, a barn, an enclosure of something of that nature. Okay, so Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. So, if we're talking about a field, that field would have to be fenced in or have a hedge row to be considered enclosed? Correct. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. And um, in section 21, would, so section 21 would prohibit someone from entering a place where animals are kept without lawful authority or um, excuse. Yep. Um, what are some of the examples? What would be some examples here? 
Well, if, some, if somebody came to a, a, the landowner or the owner of the livestock and says, um, you know, I'm uh, going to drop off some apples to feed the cattle, as an example, I've had that happen at my place, and I gave permission, not an issue. It's a, it's, it would be a case where somebody without any lawful authority or a particular reason for being there is purposely going to uh, cause harm to those animals that would impact their health and well-being, then they are in contravention of the amendment to the Act. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, th th thank you, Chair. Uh, and I want to thank the members from O'Leary and Burness for bringing this forward. I know uh, President Maynard and myself had had some early conversations on this, and uh, and uh, talks were starting to to go ahead. So I've been trying to build a strong relationship with the Federation of Agriculture because uh, you know they represent 95 percent of the farmers here on this island, and it's important that. Uh, the government has a good relationship with that people, and uh, I, I hope they feel they can come to me if they ever want to <laughs> bring some some uh, amendments to acts forward. But, uh, Mr. Maynard, could you give me some examples? Uh, I know the F Canadian Federation is talking about this, and where are we um, as a Canadian body uh, with? The, these uh, acts that are currently in place. Thank you, Mr. Minister. <clears throat> yes, we most certainly are uh, in support of this uh, this uh, uh, amendment to the act. Uh, I think that uh, you know we are in the middle of a pandemic now, and we see the ramifications of it on the uh, on humans. Uh, the same ramifications as most certainly affected in uh, in livestock also. We think of the problem that we have right now, and this is the uh, swine flu that's, uh, that's uh, uh, devastated much part of, uh, of the uh, world uh, in, the, uh, in the swine business. Uh, you know, the minister and I both have livestock. I mean, there's something that we've, uh, there's a, a disease of calves, uh, it's called Salmonella Dublin, uh, you know, devastating for, for you know, uh, calves. There's no, there's, there's no cure for them. The calves die at nine, month, at nine weeks old. Uh, you know, and it's something that's in Canada now, and we most certainly want to uh, uh, keep it uh, contained and uh, out of our out of our uh, uh, jurisdiction here on Prince Edward Island, especially. So uh, I uh, uh, would uh, ask that the uh, legislator would support this um, uh, amendment uh, because uh, we need a stronger uh, uh, protection. By our, from our animals by uh, by diseases, and uh, you know someone may come on the farm unknowingly and carrying a disease, and that's what it's, it's always a risk. We have a uh, livestock uh, industry uh, in our own industry in the dairy industry. We have uh, our proaction initiative has now said uh, the uh, biosecurity issue has just come in the September of this year, uh, where every uh, uh, dairy facility on Prince Edward Island now has signage saying. Uh, please respect biosecurity uh, and contacts the uh, numbers that you can call if you, uh, you know, when you come to the farm, if you're not already uh, accepted there, to call and say, you know, I, I would like to, I have a business with you. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's uh, to all dairy farms on Prince Edward Island. And of course, the uh, hog and poultry people uh, and uh, have had that for uh, many years uh, with restrictions. You know, uh, coming on the farm is, is something that's, uh, you, know, you, en you enter in, you may not know what you're doing. Uh, the ramifications uh, are, are maybe very far-reaching. So uh, I would ask that the uh, legislator would support this, uh, this amendment. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And uh, I was going to ask about, uh, with your lo uh, long experience with the Dairy Board, which we served together on for... Uh, Many years um, about proaction and uh, the, the pride that uh, dairy farmers take in uh, their health of their animals and uh, to make sure that all the checks and balances are are covered there. Um, I assume to put a perspective on this, this protects also protects rural PEI uh, where we uh, the least dense populated areas are where our animals are and uh, if we can't have eyes on them all the time then uh, this is 
a way of protection it and I agree with with that wholeheartedly um, member from O'Leary and Vernes I assume this would also protect uh, our valuable industry here on on the island with our harness racing uh, with uh, facility in downtown Charlottetown and downtown Summerside with uh, I would s dare say uh, millions of dollars of worth of animals in these facilities. Uh, can I have your comments on that? Yes, I mean I was involved in the harness racing industry for a little while and uh, same thing there's some pretty valuable horses that can be uh, in stalls uh, and you know, they're, although they may be looked after extremely well, once again, the, the owners may not be there all the time. Uh, we do see some of these uh, harness racing tracks are in urban centers, Charlottetown, Summerside, and, and Larry uh, has one as well. And same thing, if somebody get into those uh, locations and uh, once again, uh, did harm to the, the horse or, or uh, drug the horse. I mean, there's all kinds of factors that could come into play. Uh, we also see the issue in urban chickens is another thing. Same thing. Somebody could, once again, think that the chickens are in captivity and, uh, uh, once again, put something in the water or put something in the feed and, and it might cause a sickness or harm to that particular uh, livestock. So I don't think this is to single out anywhere uh, like urban rural i mean there may be municipal laws that might have certain uh, applicable applications but uh, this is really about protecting uh, animals on prince Edward island from harm from people who are there without permission or without authority and cause harm to those particular animals to their health or their uh, well-being minister of agriculture well thank you for that and that was uh, that's a very good point and uh, I, I know that we have our department has committed to a comprehensive review of the Animal Health Act, which is going to happen in the very near future, um, with the provision of the, the penalties that we currently have. Um, can I uh, maybe make an amendment to one of uh, Section 22 with the, uh, when it pertains to the, to the fines, just to put them in more line of our act right now? Be, and maybe the fines will increase when we do the full review. And but right now, if I make that um, amendment, would that be something you'd be acceptable? From my perspective, I would not oppose uh, things of that nature. Looks like to me, this is about keeping the spirit of the rules so, and the protection of those animals and their health and well-being. Uh, certainly, uh, would entertain any uh, motions that either keep it more in line with. Uh, the existing Animal Health Act or uh, with the direction you're going with your department. We want to be cooperative here. Okay. Minister of Agriculture. Well, I'll make this motion. Uh, this motion amends Section 1 of the Bill 120 in the proposed subsection 22 point uh, brackets 1 to change the penalty amounts to make them consistent with the pen penalty amounts set out in Section 19 of the Act. And I move that Section one of the bill number 120 is amended to propose subsection 22 uh, one by the deletion of the words 200 or more than 50,000 and uh, substitution with the words 500 to 15,000. Honorable okay. members, copy of the amendment is now being passed. We'll give you a few minutes to review and then I'll open the floor up for questions. Speaking to the um, amendment. So those who are on my list, I'll keep you for after if you want, but I'm going to start a new list for those who want to speak to the um, amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll just add, I'd like to say from certainly taking the lower end of the fine to a higher amount uh, is certainly suffice, and I, I don't necessarily have a big issue taking the higher end of the fine to a lower amount. Uh, my only comment would be is that, just remember, a lot of this livestock is uh, can be very valuable. I think you have some <laughs> livestock. I don't want to quote the numbers. You might you might say sold, but <laughs> but, but uh, you know the, there are significant uh, uh, products here. And but I'd like to say if the minister is willing to uh, review that at further date, uh, I'm certainly supportive of that Chair. amendment. Um, do you, do you have a question? Or oh, a question? I was just going to comment. Are you you okay. okay with that, Ron? Um, yeah. Okay, we, we were, dis we're okay. discussing the amendment first, and I'll come back to you. Okay? Okay. Um, members, um, the amendment has been passed around. Are there any questions on the amendment? Shall the amendment pass? Okay, shall it carry? Carry. 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 
So members, we're back now to speaking on the um, bill as amended, and I have the Minister of Agriculture. Oh, thank you, and uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I agree with the member of Larry and Burness that, uh, yeah, it's, the, the numbers probably will change when we do the uh, comprehensive review because uh, 15,000, as Mr. Maynard would know, wouldn't go very far in the dairy industry uh, <laughs> to replace some uh, very valuable animals. But it is a start, and I, I commend the uh, member for, for bringing this, and I think it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I too, would like to commend the member from O'Leary and Vanessa for bringing this bill forward, and thank you, uh, Mr. Maynard, for coming in to share this with us. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and I've been around a farm quite a bit, and but I still don't know a lot about farming. And when you get into these sorts of things, I mean, I know that you play a very important role in our lives and you produce our food. I would have, uh, looking at this bill before today, I would have just thought that these things would be implemented because, I mean, you have a very important asset there. You're providing food. And uh, it's good to see this come forward, and it's good to see that there can be some negotiation on the fines and everybody's in agreement, and I just want to thank the, minister, the member again for bringing this forward, and I'll certainly be supporting this bill. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Um, Charlottetown Brighton, you were on the list earlier, but uh, do you want to speak to the bill as amended? Um, yeah, I, I guess I was a little confused. I guess there's two amendments, 120 and 124, and I just discovered that, but I'm generally in an improvement of defining releasing animals as a, as a crime because uh, it should be defined uh, because he's, some people there's a number of people act. that think <laughs> something wrong act. there's a number of people that probably thinks that all animals should <laughs> run loose and uh, so it's good to define it I'm in support of the bill great thank you very much shall the bill carry as amended carry. Carry. you're right <laughs> So far. <laughs> I move the title, an act to amend no, the animal. An act to amend oh. the Animal Health Act. Shall it carry? Sure. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor of the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Okay. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? Here is the committee of the whole house having under consideration the bill to be intentional and not to amend the Animal Health Act. I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same with amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sure, Carrie. I have members that. Uh Confusion in that bill was partially my fault. I never had my schedule with me, and I thought he was introducing the bill. That's why I asked him for uh, a summary, and then I confused him, so that's where it... Yeah, so I thought that was the one being introduced. So, yeah. So, Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to call Bill Number 124, an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act. Shall I carry? Carry. Order number 20, an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act, Bill number 124, ordered for second reading. Honorable member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by O'Leary and Burness that the order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? carry. That the bill be read. Second time. Yeah. <laughs> Bill number 124, an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act, read a second time. 
The Honourable Member from Cornwall, Meadowbanks, third party, House Leader. I move seconded by O'Leary and Verness. This House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Thank you. Good evening. We'd like to introduce yourself for Hansard, please. Ron Maynard, uh, President of the PEF Federation of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, Minister, or sorry, Promoter, <laughs> would you like to commence with a brief statement on the bill's intent? Okay, th this bill is a little bit different than the previous one, which was more around animals' health. This is more about the release of animals or uh, letting them go, uh, you know, getting into the pens and opening them up and that. Uh, uh, unlawful authority of people entering properties. Uh, uh, and once again, letting them go out or free or whatever it might be, it might be with good intent, but it may have dire impact. So if I use the example of uh, somebody entering a chicken farm and releasing all the chickens and the chickens are outside and they're not used to being outside and they're either picked off by coyotes or get out on the road and things of that nature. So, so it's just about making sure that, uh, that this also was considered uh, an offence and uh, it, once again, although it may not create a noxious substance that would do harm to the animal in its, in its uh, health or well-being, it may have an impact on uh, the long-term well-being of the animal or, uh, or, let's say, they may not be capable of uh, sustaining an island winter and things of that nature. So, so the two bills kind of go hand in hand, I guess, is the way it was explained to me when I first proposed trying to put together uh, something of legislative uh, impact that would protect uh, these animals and uh, that's the reasoning for the second uh, piggyback bill, I guess we'd call it. Thank you, no, no pun intended. <laughs> um, um, honourable members, it's the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause, section by section, or open it up for general questions as a whole. General questions. Thank you very much. The floor is now open. Shall the bill carry? Oh, sorry. Yep. Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Uh, and again, to Mr. Maynard and the member uh -huh. from O'Leary and Verness for bringing this. And they do, they do, uh, they do go together. And uh, you do hear of stories uh, across not, across the world, but even in this country, where um, animals are released on. Uh, attempts to be <laughs> compassionate and it ends up uh, being uh, considerably uh, horrific for, for both the uh, producers and, and the animals themselves. Um, so I, I commend you for bringing this uh, along as well and uh, I don't know if the Federation of Agriculture uh, President has anything to add to uh, what this portion of the bill might uh, entail, and any examples or comments on on uh, this, this Animal Welfare Act? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah, no, I think this is this act is pro this uh, bill is probably uh, uh, as as Robbie has said a uh, piggyback of the other one, but it's also a more uh, it's probably more important mm -hmm. because. The other one is, is people may enter unknowingly, 
and cause harm. Uh, this is uh, an amendment that says people know what they're doing and are in there intentionally to cause harm. And I think this is a situation that we've seen. We were fortunate not to have seen it here in Prince Edward Island. We most certainly have seen it in other provinces in Canada. Uh, we've seen other legislatures across the country uh, enact uh, uh, regulations to uh, prohibit this. Uh, you know, the release of the animal is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, if it's a contained area, uh, if the animal, for example, is, is in, a, in a, a swine barn or a poultry barn, uh, if the animal is released, uh, the animal can't go back into there because of uh, health reasons. So the animal has to be euthanized. So even though they say they're trying to uh, it may be done for supposedly compassionate reasons. Uh, the ramifications of the animal is, uh, is quite dramatic. The other aspect of this is the ramifications on the, on the farmers. And this is really the stress point that we've seen uh, at the Canadian Federation of Agriculture and our member organizations across the country. You know, that this is someone coming into your, you know, we have a family farm in Canada. 98% of the farms in Canada are family farms. So this is someone coming into your home Think about what if someone came in to release your dog, your dog or your bird. You know, that's what this is taking place, and the stress on the on the farmer and on the family farm families is is as probably as you know for us at the Canadian Federation of Agriculture uh, is as important uh, a uh, uh, trying to alleviate that concern as it is uh, the concern on the, on the animal itself. So uh, I would hope that the uh, legislation legislator here would. Uh, 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 pass this act and, uh, and uh, put it in place. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. That was uh, very well said. And uh, when, when you think of livestock owners that have the, uh, the onus of providing uh, animal welfare to, uh, to their herds and aspects of uh, doing the best practices and recording all the best practices and to uh, to all for the health and comfort of the animals. So, uh, and I, I believe that it's also a responsibility of the general public to have that same respect that uh, farmers and farm families have for their animals. So again, I, uh, I commend the member from O'Leary Inverness uh, bringing this forward and I'm very p pleased to support it. Although I just would like to make uh, one proposed change that came from our legal uh, perspective, and uh, I have therefore proposed an amendment to the bill which clarifies the objective of the, of the amendment to address proper release of commercial animals, word of commercial. So, uh, Mr. Chair, if, if I can make a motion. Sure. Amend section one of bill 124 in the proposed section 4.11 to clarify that nature of the offense is not only entering the building or other enclosed space while knowing or being reckless as to whether entering could result in the release or escape of commercial animals, but the releasing or allowing of the escape of commercial animals are, that are kept there. And the section one of bill number 124 is amended in the proposed section 4.11 by the declaration of the word, knowing that being reckless as to whether entering such a place could result in the release or the substitution of the words and release or allow the. Thank you, Minister. All members, the amendment is being passed, it's circulated at the moment. We'll give you a couple of minutes to review it. Doesn't weaken it or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Oh, Chair, do you want to speak on this? Yeah. Um, on this amendment, then. Pardon? I, that yep. I will support. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, just uh, to add to the uh, Minister of Agriculture and Lands uh, amendment there, that uh, in my opinion will not uh, uh, water down or reduce the impact of what the intent of this uh, bill would be. 
and uh, so I, I can certainly support that amendment. And I, while, I'm, while I have the floor, Mr. Speaker, I do want to acknowledge our, our stranger on the floor here. He was actually quite uh, integral in the development of our Animal Welfare Act here in PEI, so uh, that was really the rationale behind uh, wanting to have uh, him here to uh, uh, answer any questions pertaining to that, and uh, he's been a long-time advocate for uh, farmers and uh, for uh, the uh, health and well-being of livestock and uh, their production in Prince Edward Island here, so I just want to acknowledge that. Great. Thank you. Um, honourable members, you all had an opportunity to read the motion. Are there any questions? Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Chair. Just one quick one. Can you just give up um, what the difference like what the difference is, Minister, um, the, for this change overall? Why why is it needed? It clarifies the objective of the amendment. It um, uses the word commercial animals okay. and it clarifies that and the, rele the improper release of commercial animals. So it's uh, legal, our legal body recommended these, this wording. Mermaid Stratford? Thanks. You're very welcome. Shall the amendment carry? Carry. Okay. Two We're now two speaking rooms. to the um, bill as amended. One moment of any? Yeah, I just, you know, I think sometimes uh, we take food security for granted because I think it's where we live, but I, if you look at her around the world and what has happened in the past in third world countries, I think every time we do something like this to strengthen um, farmers' resolve and our number one industry here on Prince Edward Island, I think we should take full advantage of it and to have someone sitting here that represents 95% of our industry, I think is, uh, is a good move and I give kudos to the, to, uh, the MLA for Larry and Burness and uh, I'll be fully supporting it. Thank you. Shall the bill carry as amended? Carried. Safe travels on Keep that tie. Goes good with that shirt. Chair, I move the title. An act to amend the Animal Welfare, Welfare Act. Shall it carry? Carried. Carried. I move the enacting clause. Be enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the bill to be intituled an act to amend the Animal Welfare Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same with amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks. Mr. Speaker, I move Bill Number 106 to be read a second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Order Number 11, an act to amend the Province of Prince Edward Island Land Protection Act Number 2, Bill Number 106, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks, the third party wit. I move, seconded by Larry and Burness, uh, that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 106, an act to amend the province of Prince Edward Island Land Protection Act number two, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Cornwall Meadowbanks, the third party house leader. I move, seconded uh, by Larry and Burness, that this house do uh, resolve itself into a committee of the whole house to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmero, Deputy Speaker to Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
Committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act number two. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. No. No. Um, so, Promoter, would you like to commence with a brief statement on the bill's intent? Yes, uh, I do, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, the rationale behind uh, this amendment to the Lands Protection Act Number Two is uh, stems from uh, it's been a long-standing issue here in Prince Edward Island. Land is always a very uh, a controversial subject here in Prince Edward Island. And uh, in our legislative committee hearings uh, that we had, uh, we had uh, one of the sort of the original brain trust behind the Land Protection Act, uh, Horace Carver. And he made some comments that, uh, that sort of stuck with me in regards to uh, if, uh, if uh, the government or the minister does not have the authority to uh, uh, find out who owns the land, uh, give them the tools to do that. This amendment is basically an act that says that uh, if a provision of this act or regulation made under the act is inconsistent or in conflict with other provisions of any other enactment, the provision of this act or, or the regulations made will uh, prevail in the extent of any inconsistency or conflict. So it basically says that you know we can't uh, use other uh, acts like the Business Corporation Act or other acts that to circumvent uh, not fulfilling the goals and objectives and the, I'll say the so-called spirit of the Land Protection Act. And uh, that's the rationale behind what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, same thing, I've had consultation with uh, some different farmers in my riding as well as uh, with the Federation of Agriculture and others and I've got enough feedback to uh, proceed with this. Uh, have had questions to say, is this uh, uh, <coughs> sort of special because of that? There certainly are other pieces of legislation that state similar situations that uh, when there are conflicts arising over a particular piece of legislation, uh, that that legislation, its intent prevails. Thank you very much. Um, it's the pleasure of the committee that the bill will be now read clause by clause, section by section, open up as a whole for general statements, for general questions. So I'll make this decision where we're going to open it up for general questions. As a whole. Okay. Shall the bill carry? <laughs> the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. Well, well thank you, Chair. And, and um, I, I, I do understand, uh, I think, the intention uh, that the member has bringing this this act to the floor. Um, I'm just looking at it and uh, it, it's fairly broad sweeping to say that this act, you know, really will override any regulations or uh, other legislation where there's an inconsistency. Like it's going to be placed above that. Um, I know that there's already right now an ongoing review of the of the Lands Protection Act, and because um, you know there's been a lot of debate about whether it actually has the 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 proper you know clauses in it to fully protect our lands the way we want it to, um, and I think this could impact a whole a whole slew of regulations and others, and I'm just wondering if the member did any sort of scan as to uh, the number of sets of regulations and other acts that this this might impact uh, where the LPA you would see started to start to take precedence. Well, honorable member, uh, the reality is is that uh, you know, I would see that this is a priority for islanders. It's important that islanders are well aware that uh, uh, you know, it's important to them, anyway, to uh, who's the owners of our land. It's been a long-standing issue in Prince Edward Island here, right back from uh, our absentee landlords, uh, lords who, uh, uh, you know, had tenant farmers. So, uh, you know, we've we, it's always hotly debated issue uh, around, uh, you know, the amount of acres uh, in corporations, the amount of acres an individual owns, and uh, all this simply does is just simply say that if the minister can't get access to information to find out who owns land, then uh, this, this will, gives him the authority to do that, and or he or she, <laughs> to uh, make sure that they uh, can get the access to the information. I mean, they, uh, it, it's just a, it's as simple as that. There, there are other acts that uh, take precedence this way too, uh, so that's not necessarily uncommon. 
but uh, it's just a, it's as simple as whether this legislature feels it's important to grant the minister the authority uh, to find out who owns land. Chair. Minister of Education. So, do you know of a case right now where there there is a conflict between the Land Protection Act and other existing acts, where you know this paramountcy provision what? would be required? Well, it, it has been stated that we that uh, under the Business Corporations Act that uh, uh, the minister didn't have the authority to find out who all the shareholders are. Well, this would say that the Business Corporations Act doesn't supersede the Lands Protection Act. So, at the end of the day, the Lands Protection Act is an important bill upon itself, and it has uh, you have the ability to find out. Like I said, it's about what Horace Carver said give the minister the authority to find out who owns the land. And uh, it's, it's really as simple as that. It, this doesn't impede upon the minister from implementing other regulations, other uh, amendments to, uh, you know, to determine the amount of acres that Isla should own. And I think that's the Land Matters Committee will start to think about those things. This only would strengthen whatever the Land Matters Committee comes up with. So I, I just don't see it as something that would be an impediment upon the minister should they decide they want to use it. That's up to the minister to decide how they use this legislation. And uh, enough this legislature to pressure the minister to implement these rules. It just means that they can't uh, use the, the excuse that we can't find out because the Business Corporation Act uh, prevents us from doing that. Minister of Education. Um, so, I mean, you brought up the Land Matters Project again, and, and um, as we know, that is ongoing. And we don't know what changes are going to result from that. Um, do you think it's maybe a little bit premature to be to be putting in this this sort of uh, overriding these sort of overriding provisions for Land Protection Act when we already have that process started? I mean, um, I, I would feel I think maybe more comfortable if we had the Land Matters recommendations and possibly even the amended Land Protection Act before we decided to give these really fairly strong provisions for to the Lands Pr Protection Act. Uh, I don't know. What do you think of that? Well, my view on that is, is we've had land reviews for many times. What's this, number three, I think? And uh, we've, uh, you know, implemented some of the recommendations. We haven't implemented some of the recommendations in the past. I would suspect that this, this uh, committee would be no different. I mean, it'll come up with some good recommendations and others that it won't. No matter what the recommendations that the Land Matters Committee comes up with, this, this simply would state that uh, this act and the rules that uh, the, the minister uh, takes from that to implement in potential legislation or regulation, that those decisions are, as it pertains to land, are paramount. They, they, they supersede any other legislation that may exceed out there, or be ex in existence out there. So, so I would say, no, it does not. Uh, and I say it will, will, only, will only strengthen what the Land Matters Committee recommends. And of that, it's what the minister decides he wants to pick out of that uh, and actually legislate, implement, regulate. You know, that, that's the authorities that the minister has. And I, I would also say it just simply gives the minister responsible for agriculture and land the authority to get the information that they want. And anybody that circumvents that uh, by not divulging and not providing that information, they are, you know, uh, subject to potential penalty or, uh, uh, you know, authority that the minister wants to impose on them. Minister of Education. Um, so when, when it comes to, uh, you know, the legal implications of this, this sort of thing, um, I think the devil really is in the in the details, and and you need to go to, to the experts, like the legislative management office, for example, and and you need to talk to, uh, the legislative experts within government and within the departments, and, and the people that really can can clearly identify how, you know, the LPA interacts with other acts like the Planning Act or the Registry Act, for example. Did you consult? With the legislative management office and, and 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 bring them in to do work, or any of the the government departments that would be impacted by this. 
Well, basically, Honorable Member, we've uh, drafted the legislation. I, I'm not the writer of the word for word here. I mean, that's uh, done through our, our uh, member's office uh, that consults with the legislative uh, advisors and how to draft legislation. So that, for, you know, as far as the wording goes, I'm certainly uh, uh, following their recommendations and how this is worded. Uh, this was tabled in the spring sitting. And, uh, you know, so it's been on the, the floor, it's on the docket of our Legislative Assembly here. Uh, you know, we certainly have had consultation and discussions with the uh, farm organizations out there. Once again, I would not see that this would impede anything. It, like I say, it, it's not precedent setting. There's other uh, pieces of legislation that say, say something very similar. To say it's uh, uh, complicated, it's it's basically three lines, <laughs> so it's it's not really uh, that complicated or, or difficult uh, to interpret. Uh, it just simply says that this, when it comes to the Lands Protection Act number two, that the legislation within that act prevails over any conflictory other pieces of legislation uh, that would inhibit the minister from getting the information to enforce the spirit of the Lands Protection Act. I don't know if I could word it any better than that. Minister of Education. Did you get a, a legal opinion on the implications that this act might have? As far as a legal opinion, just other than the legal people that uh, draft this up, I mean, it's as legal as, I mean, we, we, are, we are the people who determine the spirit and rules of the law. It's up to then the judges and courts to uh, interpret it, and they'll interpret it many different ways. This is as simple as saying that the minister has the authority to not be inhibited in, in uh, the spirit of the Lands Protection Act. So it's really up to government to decide, you know, is this something that's important to them? As, as we as islanders, or is this important that the Lands Protection Act matters? Hey, so. uh, Cornwall Meadowbank. Mr. Speaker, could I have an intervention? Uh, you can ask a question. Sure. You know, we're, we're talking like this, like this is brand new, but as the Minister of Finance and I will both concur that the Financial Administration Act does exactly the same as what he's proposing here, only obviously different acts, but there is a precedent set in, in under the Act, and the Financial Administration Act is basically the same. So it supersedes, and there's a process and protocol in place for it. Thank you. Cool. We can adjourn. Uh, the, so, honorable members, uh, there was an arrangement made that at 840 we go revert back to um, the opposition time. No, private members. Private, private members, people. sorry. Private members. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Carry. carry. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, the Committee of the Whole House having under consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act number two, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? carry. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donor of the Government, House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, uh, uh, seconded by the Member from Montague Kilmer, that motion number 33 now be read. Shall I carry? Carry. Motion number, number 33. The Honourable Member from Montague Kilmuir moves, seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas type 1 di diabetes is a chronic, life threatening autoimmune disease that impacts a person's ability to produce and regulate insulin, and whereas approximately 85% of people living with type 1 diabetes are adults, and close to 1 in 5 are diagnosed as adults. 
And whereas the use of, of insulin pumps offers more effective symptom management versus multiple daily injections of insulin, and whereas the cost of insulin pumps can be prohibitive for those with low incomes leading to potential in inequality of care, and whereas currently on Prince Edward Island financial support for insulin pumps is offered to individuals aged 19 and younger, Therefore, be it resolved that this Legislative Assembly urge government to work towards broader coverage of insulin pumps to help Islanders living with type 1 diabetes better manage their condition and reduce long-term health care costs. The Honourable Member from uh, Montague Kilmuir to start today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's uh, certainly a pleasure to rise uh, this evening and move this motion and uh, that calls on the government to support Islanders living with type 1 diabetes and to fund uh, for insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors Heard enough. or flash monitors. These islanders have a chronic illness and without constant monitoring and treatment, they will die. This illness overwhelmingly impacts our youth population. I believe it is government's role to protect our children. We need to do absolutely everything in our power to ensure the next generation will lead long, healthy and prosperous lives. Mr. Speaker, we've made progress on this front with the passage of the flavored vaping ban, which, uh, which I thank the Assembly for, but there is much work to do. As I stand here today in Diabetes Awareness Month, I am representing the ever-increasing number of Islanders living with insulin-dependent diabetes, and they are asking for our help. Mr. Speaker, we are currently in a place where there is no need to prick your fingers to check your blood sugar. Not only can these blood sugar levels be electronically read, they can be wirelessly sent to a parent or teacher's phone or device. Think of how beneficial it would be for the teacher of a kindergarten child with insulin-dependent diabetes to know if their blood sugar is crashing and they need some juice. Our government does not currently provide support for these improvements in technology, and I'm asking today for that to change. This proposal is focused on modernizing our approach to diabetes care in Prince Edward Island. While the province does provide some support, we are not providing enough. Mr. Speaker, according to Diabetes Canada, it is estimated that almost 10% of our province, or approximately 16,000 islanders, are living with diagnosed type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Even more concerning, estimates show almost one, one third of the province has, di has diagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes or pre-diabetes. That means almost 50,000 Islanders have diabetes or may soon have diabetes, and, in, and many of them don't even know it. Diabetes is ruthless to the body. Per Diabetes Canada, diabetes contributes to 30% of strokes, 40% of heart attacks, 50% of kidney failure, re, kidney failure requiring dialysis, and 70% of non-traumatic lower limb amputations every year and is a leading cause of vision loss. Diabetes complications are associated with premature death, and di diabetes can reduce lifespan by 5 to 15 years. People with diabetes are over 3 times more likely to be hospitalized with cardiovascular disease, 12 times more likely to be hospitalized with end-stage renal disease, and almost 20 times more likely to be hospitalized for a non-traumatic lower limb amputation compared to the general population. The prevalence of clinically relevant depressive symptoms among people with diabetes is about 30%. Individuals with depression have an approximately 60% increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has placed even more emphasis on addressing gaps within the province's diabetes program. Recent studies have shown that up to 30% of all COVID deaths had diabetes as a pre-existing condition. But recent studies have also shown that well-controlled blood sugar can significantly improve the likelihood of a positive outcome. Experts agree the, that blood sugar, blood sugar control is crucial in managing and reducing the risk of these complications. Studies have shown that strong blood sugar control lowers the risk of complications and extends lifespan. As a province, we need to ensure that we provide access to the tools that allow this blood sugar control. There is no silver bullet to addressing the diabetes problem on Prince Edward Island, but providing continuous glucose monitors or flash monitors or the access to insulin pumps is a huge step forward. Mr. Speaker, we need to begin providing coverage for advanced glucose monitoring systems for insulin-dependent diabetes. These devices, often called continuous glucose monitors or flash monitors, replace the dated practice of finger pricks. Additionally, these devices allow sharing of information with parents, teachers, and other caregivers. 
we can see if their sugar is turning up or down simply by checking our phones and act quickly before a danger arises. But most importantly, these devices are shown to improve blood sugar control. As I st stated earlier, blood sugar control is the number one factor in preventing life impacting, highly expensive diabetes complications. Our province currently provides no support for these devices. That has to change. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I do have a, a few notes left, but I want to wrap up my remarks so that the seconder can uh, also say a few words before we run out of time this evening. But um, this is uh, an issue that I've been lobbied on a lot uh, by constituents in my district. Uh, and recently, when I was out to, out to eat at a restaurant, I had uh, the waitress, um, her daughter, lives with type 1 diabetes and uh, she was desperate in desperate need of help and uh, you know she, I think she said uh, you know as some people can't they can't afford they don't have coverage for this and uh, you know or and if they don't have coverage they can't afford that uh, that upfront cost to, to purchase these life-saving treatments so um, I'd strongly urge the house to support this motion and I look forward to hearing the seconders remarks thank you mr. speaker I'll ask the second of the motion, Charlottetown, West Raleigh. Yeah, I'd like to uh, first start by thanking uh, Montague Kilmer for, for allowing me to second this important uh, motion, and I, I, I concur that this is, uh, this is a very important topic. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I had the opportunity to coach um, in grade 8 students, um, and one of, the, uh, one of the players that I coached was was uh, diabetic and she struggled with just this. So I, I got a sense of understanding how difficult it was for her when she would run up and down the floor, she would be in the middle of a play and just pop off and say, I'm low. And you know, it was almost like she, it was a code word for, you know, like I'm, I'm going through a difficult situation here, poof, off right away. It's something that, uh, it's something that low, high, controlling your blood sugar, it's, it's very difficult for that age. and I understand how families deal with it and it, it's it's quite remarkable how how they come together and bond but i think we can do more now the commitment to wellness is a lifelong journey and to avoid and mitigate development of chronic disease such as cardiovascular disease it is necessary to participate in some forms of physical activity every day uh, it, it's it's no different people living with chronic illness such as type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes accounts for 5 to 15 percent of all diabetes cases. It's an autoimmune disorder in which the body's own ability to produce insulin in the pancreas is destroyed. There is no cure and it is not brought on by obesity. It has often occurred in children or early adult years and its onset is usually very rapid. Despite recent studies, there is currently no identified way to prevent type 1 diabetes, and there are no modifiable risk factors to delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. And it is not something that you can grow out of or subsidize after the age of 25. People living with type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes must take insulin daily through injections, whether by needle, pen, device, or continuous insulin pump therapy. I believe it's time to look forward to create a new strategy to take us through the next five years. In PEI, children and youth under the age of 25 can access provincial funding to support purchasing the pumps and supplies, but what happens after the age of 25? Type 1 diabetes doesn't disappear. The biggest barrier to type 1 diabetes is from participating in physical activity is fear of having an episode um, of hypoglycemia. Uh, this can more effectively be controlled and avoided with the use of an insulin pump. One of my constituents uh, shared with me her experience and support for this needed therapy. Um, and she's one of the most active people I, I know. She's always trying to control her diabetes through walking and being physically active. The cost of the pumps is fairly major investments. However, the difference in diabetes control and management pays dividends. One can look from a perspective that better improved diabetes controls lower, lowers overall cost as, diabe as diabetics and more susceptible to heart and stroke and kidney disease, as the, as the mover said. Or you can look in terms of the short-term gains for health of islanders. For example, Mr. Speaker, a pump can alert to low and high blood sugars if a sensory is warm. It can avoid a diabetic seizure in a person who doesn't wake up and alert to low blood sugars, thereby avoiding seizures or, in the worst case scenario, death. Insulin pumps 
are a therapy which most closely mimics a uh, functioning pancreas and a non-diabetic individuals. It provides micro doses of insulin over the course of the day in lieu of giving two or three injections a day. This results in fewer peaks and valleys. So if you picture your blood glucose as a graph, pump therapy has the potential to level the graph out a bit. Pumps are also invaluable for when you are exercising as you can reduce the dose per hour known as temporary basis. Then blood sugars doesn't, doesn't crash requiring the diabetic to consume sugar in some form to raise the blood, blood sugar. Often a low is followed by a bounce back or a high blood sugar. These are the dangerous spikes and peaks. Insulin pumps have the potential to extend lives, save lives, and maintain independence. So given all these factors and the benefit to individuals and Islanders health as a whole, along with the upstream benefit to, health, to our health system, I support this motion and thank the mover for bringing it forward and look forward to debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I'd sincerely like to thank uh, the mover and seconder for bringing this, uh, this motion to the floor as well. And it's great to see a, a private member working with a member of the third party on, on such an important motion. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as we all know, diabetes is a very serious health issue that affects more than 15,000 Islanders. And government recognizes the burden of diabetes and is committed to continue to support investments in diabetes care and management. Since November of 2008, Islanders with diabetes who are insulin dependent receive coverage to a maximum of 100 test strips per month, testing approximately three times per day. For women prescribed insulin during pregnancy, blood glucose test strip coverage provides 250 strips per month, and that was as of uh, November 2017. Children, youth registered under the insulin pump program are eligible to receive a one-time benefit of 500 test strips at no cost at the time of the pump initiation, regardless of family income. This uh, allowed for additional blood glucose testing at the period of transition to insulin pump therapy. The insulin pump program provides assistance with the cost of approved insulin pumps and supplies for children and youth under the age of 19 years of age who are living with type 1 diabetes. And depending upon household income and private medical insurance, families may be eligible for up to 90% coverage to assist with the cost of the pump and monthly pump supplies. Mr. Speaker, all families whose child youth met the medical requirements for insulin pump therapy and who applied for financial assistance under the program received benefits. And we are adopting a provincial diabetes strategy, and that was a step towards uh, helping Islanders manage their diabetes and improve the quality of life. However, Mr. Speaker, that strategy uh, was introduced in 20, 2014, and it is, uh, in my view, out of date. Um, we have a new strategy that we're about to uh, announce here very shortly. Um, so the province is preparing to launch a new four-year diabetes strategy with a renewed focus on diabetes prevention, detection, and management. And when I talk about management, I talk about things such as uh, uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices, uh, most people uh, related to uh, Free Libra. I'm talking about insulin pumps. We're talking about test strips. But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I met with... Uh, the Atlantic representative from the uh, um, Diabetes Association of Canada uh, recently, uh, and a, a young gentleman as well who's a strong vocal advocate uh, for, uh, for uh, technology with regards to monitoring and treatment of diabetes. And uh, th what they were talking about and, and what they were really excited about is, is how quickly the technology is changing. Uh, just in the, in the matter of the last five or six years, uh, whether it's the insulin pumps that, that came on stream and, and new improved insulin pumps or whether it was the CGMs that go in line with those. So, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing tremendous uh, advances in technology. And as a government, I, I do agree that uh, it's time that we do start to uh, invest more in that. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, in, uh, in other, in other uh, news with regards to the diabetes strategy and... and it's not just a provincial issue. Um, there's a big move afoot with all the provincial uh, health ministers, territorial health ministers, to encourage the federal government to adopt 
a initiative that uh, Diabetes Canada is promoting. It's called Diabetes 360. And basically what it is, it's a strategy to completely uh, wrap around uh, Canadians, not just Islanders, but Canadians that, that uh, are living with, with diabetes. And Mr. Speaker, we are having conversations on, on the federal, provincial, territorial level. Uh, I'm quite encouraged by initial discussions around that, and hopefully we can push this, this forward. Uh, as the Honourable Mover of this motion alluded to uh, when he started speaking, November is uh, Diabetes Month, National Diabetes Month here in Canada. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, hopefully in the next few days to be able to make a, a very positive announcement with regards to some new investments that uh, this government are going to be putting forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to rise in support of this motion. Uh, many islanders are not covered under private insurance, and even those who are, uh, private insurance companies will often not cover the cost of insulin pumps. Uh, unless the payer is able to advocate strongly for this to happen. I've spoken with constituents who have been there, and it can be a battle. My only concern is that this motion doesn't go far enough uh, to meet the real and persistent daily needs of those with type 1 diabetes. Uh, it's, it calls for broader coverage for insulin pumps, which is very important. But while expanding access to insulin pumps is a critical step that prevents the need for multiple daily injections, we must also consider the role and positive impacts of continuous glucose monitoring, monitor, monitoring or CGMs, which have been brought up here uh, this evening, so like the Libra sensor or Dexcom, which help monitor sugars uh, by the minute. So for example, um, the Libra sensor, it's on your arm for 14 days and can test your blood sugar at any time. Um, I, want, I know we're short on time here, so I just want to uh, quickly speak about an example um, uh, from a, a constituent uh, in my district who has, whose daughter has type 1 diabetes, and she told me her daughter can feel when her blood sugar begins to drop. Uh, some days she would test and um, she would continue to test because she wanted to affirm the results of the test and she would be using up to 17 test strips a day. So it's not um, difficult to see how 100 test strips in a month uh, is really going to fall short. Call the hour. Honourable members, the hour has been called. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna and the Government House Leader. You, uh... Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I moved... Uh... Seconded by the uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing that this House do adjourn until uh, November 25th at 2 o'clock in the p.m. Charlotte Carey? Carey. 